So yeah, so uh, just just to get, just to kind of you know like we've been on a bit of a journey together, you could say. I mean, it is a noble eightfold path, and we've been you know uh, walking along this path together for the last eight weeks. I can't quite believe it's been eight weeks, but it has. Um, so we started, I think, at the end of January um, on this course, or maybe it was the beginning of February. And uh, yeah, we started by by exploring this whole idea of perfect vision this whole idea, which is really central to Buddhism, that we can wake up to the way things are. And that's not uh, necessarily a once and for all kind of thing. It can be um, a, a kind of incremental revelation or an incremental um, glimpse that deepens and broadens and expands as we go on. Um, so we can actually have yeah, an intimation um, of the way things really are, of reality. So that's that's perfect vision, um, gaining this as it were, altered insight into the into the real nature of things, and um, that sets sets going the path. It begins with vision, and then of course the path of transformation uh, begins, which is the transformation of the whole of the rest of our being, the whole of the rest of our self, uh, in accordance with that vision. And that starts, as we heard, with perfect emotion. So transforming our emotions, um, our emotional nature. And finding emotional equivalence for that insight, for that perspective, for that vision. And then we begin to transform the way we, that we communicate with other people. So communication, of course, being an absolutely central aspect of our lives as human beings. And we begin to transform that. And that insight, that vision also begins to transform the way that we behave, the way that we act in relation to others, what we say and, and what we do. And then um, it extends into our livelihood, uh, into the way that we are now living. And here we move from individual transformation to the transformation of the collective. And then uh, we move into perfect effort, which is yeah, recognizing that the Dharma life, the Buddhist life, um, requires effort as an act of life. And we heard about how we can basically yeah, prevent unskillful mental states, uh, eradicate unskillful states, develop skillful states and maintain skillful states. And through doing that, we, we actually transform our will um, in a way we transform um, the, that basic drive, that, that basic um, impulse to, that, that is who we are. And we, we are a body and forth of that basic kind of will. And then we looked at awareness. So that's what we looked at last week. Again, quite a very central uh, practice and um, principle within the Dharma, the development of awareness. And we looked at how, um, in particular, mindfulness consists of recollection, remembering what we're doing. It consists of undistractedness. It consists of um, developing concentration, gathering together. It consists of a continuity and steadfastness of purpose and a continually developing individuality. And we further saw that there's levels of awareness. We begin with awareness of things, so just being aware of our environment, either the, a created environment um, or a, a natural environment. We developed awareness of, of self, so our body, our feelings and thoughts, our emotions, uh, um, awareness of other people, and how, yeah, when we are already deeply aware of others, that stimulates us, and then awareness of, of reality. Um, so we, we come we come now to the the eighth limb. Uh, oh. Can you let me screen share, um, Kevin? It's not letting me screen share. Maybe do I need to be made a co-host or something? It's no big stress if it just, if I can't. Oh, oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so that's our image of the of the wheel of the eightfold path or the eight spokes, and of course we we now um, we've now kind of revolved all the way around, and we're um, we're coming to the to the eighth uh, spoke. So yeah, so we've looked at the perfect vision, perfect emotion, and so on, and and then we find ourselves at um, perfect samadhi. Um, so you'll notice that um, well. It's, the slide's gone now, but you, you would have noticed that I'd, I didn't translate uh, the word Samadhi. 
Um, sometimes with these Buddhist words, it's actually easier just to leave them untranslated because the it can be quite difficult to find an adequate English translation. Um, for example, like we often use the word meta, uh, just because it's really difficult to find an English word uh, that adequately expresses what meta is. It's really difficult to do that. So we often just say meta and after a while you get you get to um, to understand what that means. And and by, by the way, actually, I think um, that's one of the wonderful things about discovering Buddhism. Um, we learn these new words and they don't have any baggage for us. I was just reading uh, um, about an author called Christopher Isherwood, who uh, was a British writer, a 20th century writer, and uh, he got involved in um, Hindu philosophy. And he writes, this is in the late 1930s, early 1940s, and he talks about just the, 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 one, the wonder of exploring this whole new language, the language of Sanskrit, and how all of these spiritual ideas that he was encountering, he could, he could encounter them in a, in a fresh way because the language was fresh. It didn't have any of the baggage that words like, or God, or faith, or even the word religion, no, it didn't have any of that baggage. So he, so he was able to just come to it with a fresh kind of mind. And I think it's a little bit like that with, with, um, with Buddhism. Sometimes it's, it's, it's good to, to, to learn these words um, because it's, it's, they very adequately express something which, yeah, like English words don't. Or, and also, furthermore, English words often have a whole rake of uh, connotations which can get in the way of us understanding what they're really referring to. So anyway, so so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about perfect samadhi here, and I'll talk. And it's the eighth limb or the eighth aspect. And what it means, what samadhi means, is it means the state of being firmly fixed or firmly established. And it's got two basically two ways that that word is used in in, in the Buddhist tradition. Um, <clears throat> and the way that it's used depends on the context. So it's a bit confusing sometimes, to be honest, with Buddhism, is that you get, you know, a word, like even the word Dharma, the Buddha's teaching, that word can, it's got about five different meanings, which are quite different, depending on the context. And sometimes it's, it takes a little bit of deciphering to figure out what exactly um, is meant in that context. So anyway, the word Samadhi um, can mean, um, let me just, I've actually got this written down. Um, so it can mean the establishment of the mind on a single object. So in other words, that's like concentration. Yeah. So when we become absorbed in meditation, we enter samadhi because we're establishing the mind um, on, a, on a single ob object. We're fixing the mind on a sing single object. Um, <clears throat> and then secondly, um, this is a much more exalted meaning of the word samadhi. It's um, Where's it gone? The establishment of the, of uh, the whole being in a certain mode of consciousness or a certain level of awareness. Yeah. So that's a much broader, much deeper meaning of the word um, samadhi. So very often um, samadhi is just translated as concentration. In other words, it's, it's interpreted as being the first meaning, but um, I won't go. I won't go into it. If you want to go, if you want to get all the reasoning, you can read the book. But Sangharachita, um, basically, who, who I'm kind of following with this course, says that um, it's much more the second. If you take it in terms of just concentration, um, you, anyway, you minimise the, the the breadth of meaning that is truly suggested by the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path. Because when we when we reach the eighth stage, we're coming to the culmination of the whole path. So it does, even though that the different the different limbs are limbs, are aspects, the eighth limb has a very, very strong suggestion of a culmination. So we've traveled along a path and we come into the culmination or, or the consummation of, of that path. So yeah, so um, yeah, that's just a little bit of background on um, what the word samadhi means. And, and, and in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path, um, it means primarily the second, or although the first meaning, um, the concentration is included. <clears throat> so hopefully that's clear. Um, so in other words, what, what perfect uh, samadhi means is the complete permeation of the whole of one's being by perfect vision. Yes, so we've talked about it in terms of the path of transformation, of transforming these different aspects in accordance with that vision. So perfect samadhi, you could say, is when that 
transformation is complete. Yeah, so the whole being has com been completely transformed, completely permeated. So while there's these two meanings, these two distinct meanings of the word samadhi, they're not mutually exclusive. So in a way, what they are is the lower and higher degrees of the same type of experience. So when we become absorbed in meditation, we have that experience of um, union, of harmony, of balance, of integration, which is um, um, you know, emblematic of or symbolizes uh, what enlightenment is on a much higher level. It's not enlightenment, but it's, it's akin to it. It's on the same kind of spectrum of experiences. So I'm going to, sorry about all these Pali and Sanskrit terms, but I'm going to give you another one, which is uh, shamatha. So when we're talking about this lower degree of um, samadhi, uh, which means that, that the establishment of the mind on an object, we, we, we're going to talk in terms of shamatha. Um, the higher degree, we're going to use the word samadhi. And there's an intermediate degree, which is um, samapati, which means something like um, attainment. So I've got three... Um, three words for you here. Um, so there they all are. So shamatha um, is, the, is yeah, the, the lower degree. And that means something like um, tranquility. Yeah, well, that's what actually what it literally means, that the word literally means tranquility. And uh, the, the uh, samapati, which is a, a attainment, and then the highest level is samadhi. Um, which here is equivalent to awakening, it's equivalent to enlightenment, it's equivalent to nirvana, the goal, yeah, where the whole being is completely transformed, which of course is the whole point of the Eightfold Path. So if we can see them as, as a single progressive series of, of spiritual experiences, first developing shamatha, developing tranquility and calm, integrating our energy, and then on the basis of that, developing um, sam samapati. And then from there, we develop um, samadhi. Yeah. So um, I'll just talk about each of those in turn. So beginning with um, shamatha. Um, so this corresponds to what we talked about two weeks ago um, when we talked about uh, perfect effort and developing unarisen skillful mental states. So if you remember, we talked here, yeah, we heard about the jhanas and we, we heard that they corresponded to um, these images to do with water, the soap powder um, being blended with water and completely soaking up all the water and that the, the soap powder being completely saturated by the liquid. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so that was the, um, well, in a way, we've already encountered this um, but uh, yeah, but when we when we talk about it in terms of shamatha, it's like it, it's um yeah it, the suggestion is of tranquility and and it's a quite an interesting thing to notice that when we do become absorbed, um, our energy is is calm, it's tranquil, even though it's unified, um, it's it's tranquil. I, I always think of the image of a, of a great river. So with a great river, um, there's a lot of water going down it. But there's not much movement, um, you know. Like a, <clears throat> I'm thinking of a, of, a, of a large. I mean, even the Liffey, you know, it's not the, the largest river in the world. But it, but it's very. There's a lot of water going down it, but it's very, very calm, as opposed to a mountain stream which bubbles and hisses and water's popping all over the place. But there's actually not very much water going down it. So the the mind that is um, tranquil. Is the the energy is all flowing together, and that and that gives that that tranquility, that calm, that peace. And um, you can understand uh, that shamatha, that process of absorption in an object, uh, in terms of having three kind of three degrees. Um, so another set of three for you. Um, so uh, three degrees of increasing uh, concentration, and and. I don't know if you remember last week we, we finished the evening with a, a, a meditation where we visualized or we uh, evoked the Buddha. Um, and so th this is a common practice that you find in the Buddhist tradition. So you, you first of all, you, you concentrate on a material object. So this image behind me, so you could you could develop concentration by first of all, just looking at the image. So you're, with your eyes open, you're looking at the image and you become absorbed in that image. And then you, in a way you close your eyes 
but you continue to see the image but now it's a mind made image yeah it's a it's an image um that you're seeing with your mind's eye so to speak and with practice you can really develop the ability to do this to see an image of the buddha um here not made of paint or plaster but made of light um and that itself that, that, that itself is, is is highly expressive of the of the nature of um of the buddha um, and then you become absorbed in that image. Uh, so what happens there is you actually be, be kind of, as it were, merge with the image. You become so absorbed in the image of the Buddha that you no longer experience yourself as being separate from the image. Um, you are just, uh, as it were, one with it, or at least there's not two things, there's just one experience. So you, you might have experienced that in, in meditation where you just become so absorbed that you no longer have an experience of you doing the meditation. There's just meditation happening. There's just absorption happening. So if you're doing the mindfulness of breathing, it just feels like there's just breathing. That's all there is, just, just breathing and a deep sense of um, wholeness within, within that single uh, activity or that single um, experience of absorption. So yeah, so, so th this represents a kind of a deepening of that process of um, tranquilizing or as it were, or calming or integrating in, in the mind. And um, it just that doesn't just happen um, with you know visualizing a Buddha. It could happen, for example, in the mindfulness of breathing. So often when we start breathing, well, when we start breathing, we're doing the mindfulness of breathing. Often what we have is just an idea of the breathing. We start with that. We start with this notion of breathing, and then we begin to try and locate that in our actual experience as an experience, not as a thought, but as an experience. Which often means just developing that sort of curiosity where we begin to just identify what breathing actually is at that given time, that given point. And then we kind of connect. So that corresponds to the first stage. Um, and um, and then we, we begin to uh, become absorbed in the breathing. So this is, this is you know, where the, um, the counting comes in handy. It helps us to gather ourselves, to stabilize um, a sense of um, what the breathing is. And then it becomes more and more subtle. You might have had this experience that you the breath the breath becomes so subtle as you meditate that it almost disappears. You almost can't locate it anymore. It's just very very subtle, particularly when you uh, feel it around your nose, for example. So there's a kind of corresponding um, process of deepening absorption um, when you do the mindfulness of breathing. And ultimately, what happens if you get absorbed in the breathing? Like I said, it just feels like there's just breathing happening. It's not like you're there doing the practice. The practice is just sort of almost doing itself sometimes being absorbed feels like that so, so that's yeah so that's the first degree is is um samatha or shamatha and then we come to uh, samapati um which means something like attainment um and and what 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 happens um when we practice meditation is is particularly early on i think um and this depends on personal temperament but all sorts of unusual experiences can arise. Um, some of you might have experienced this. If you haven't, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean an awful lot. Um, but it just, it's just an indication that things are beginning to move. Our consciousness is beginning to kind of loosen up. So for example, sometimes people see lights. I've known people talk. It just hasn't happened to me particularly, but I've spoken to people on meditation retreats who have talked about um, like hearing a mantra and their whole body just being filled with white light. I've heard people talking in that kind of way, or sometimes people hear sounds. Um, again, it's not something that I've experienced, but you, you like hear like a like a, a deep uh, note, or like even people sort of hear like well, you know, angels singing. You know what I mean? Like some of the some of the um, the things that are spoken of in different traditions as sort of spiritual experiences might belong to this kind of samapati type. Um, of experience, you know, for example, hearing the, hearing the voice of an angel or he, even hearing the voice of God um, from, a, from a Buddhist point of view, what's happening is there's some deeper aspect of the mind is communicating. It's not an external being. Um, you might hear, uh, sorry, smell scents, um, uh, um, fragrances that, that aren't actually physically present. Um, well, you might see images. Now, this, this is quite common. Um, you just sit down to meditate and then um, you just see an image. Like I remember a friend of mine, when he sat down to meditate, he would, he would do the image of flames, of, of uh, 
flames would, would come into his mind. So he'd, be, he'd feel like he was sitting kind of almost like in a fire. It wasn't unpleasant. It was actually very pleasant. But that was the way he experienced it. I know another friend of mine who, when he meditated, he, he saw the image of a burning book. Um, I've, um, for me, water. Sometimes I have images of water, of like looking down into water. You, you might have your own uh, kind of image that has, has just arisen in your practice. Uh, it can be quite a wonderful thing, actually. Sometimes, well, you just uh, you just there with an image, or or you might see some someone almost like a figure, like a face, or a kind of archetypal or symbolic figure. Um, also, sometimes you you have a, an experience of your body kind of changing shape, um, or changing like the mass of your body changing. So you feel very very light. You f or you feel very heavy, or you feel like you're on your side, or you're upside down. It's, I don't know. I've had experiences like that. I've, or people sometimes feel like they're spinning. I've had an experience of quite feeling like I've shrunken down to a very, very small point. Um, sometimes even, you know, people have experiences where they can have a sense of what other people are thinking. Um, yeah, there's, all, there's a whole range of different um, sort of experiences that can arise through, through the practice of meditation it can even be like you know flashes of, of insight glimpses of reality um, can arise with, within meditation um, so, the, so this is a sort of a in a way it doesn't it doesn't mean if you don't have this experience it doesn't mean that you're not getting anywhere because some people don't seem to have these kinds of experiences and other people seem to have loads of them I mean I used to live with a guy who like every meditation it was like he'd been to some of the planet and back um uh and i my meditation just be quite humdrum so it's quite particular to the individual these kinds of things but it's worth just pointing out because some of you i'm sure will have had these kinds of experiences so anyway the the, the next stage of course is is um a samadhi proper as it were so this is samadhi in a deeper sense um so this is the state of being um established in reality um so this is quite exalted you know well it is exalted it's it's the, it's in a way synonymous with the goal it's suggestive it's suggestive of the goal and and we can look at this um as is often the case with buddhism um, we can look at it in negative terms and positive or in positive terms so what this state of samadhi in the, in the in the deeper sense means is the complete fading away of what are called the ashra ashravas another party in sanskrit word ashravas and the ashravas are poisonous fluxes. They are like a bias or a lopsidedness in our nature. So they're thought to, thought to be very, very deep, um, these are these ashravas or asavas. So they are the, the, the kamashvara, which is a craving for sense experience for its own sake. So there's just this deep kind of hunger almost that we have just to experience uh, the world through our senses. And then there's um, bhavashvara, which is the desire for Bhava means becoming, so it's the desire for any mode of existence short of enlightenment. And then avijashvara, avijya is like spiritual ignorance. Um, it's just this profound uh, darkness. We just actually kind of don't want to know what's going on. There's, there's a kind of an impulse within us or a drive within us or a, or a bias um, towards unawareness, towards ignorance, towards ignoring, not wanting to know. So it's said that when samadhi is attained, those three asavas um, fade, they completely pass away, they're destroyed. And positively, um, there are these three um, samadhis. And this will, this will all sound maybe quite exalted, and it is quite exalted, but hopefully I'll be able to give some kind of suggestion of, of what the state might be like. So the first of these samadhis, these positive samadhis, or this positive way of expressing what this is, is called the imageless, um, the animata. And this is a state that's uh, free from conceptualization. So we're so um, habituated to conceptualize that often we don't, we kind of associate, um, actually I can turn that screen share off now. We often associate um, existing with thinking. Um, for us, it's almost the same thing. Um, but what's being suggested here is a state where discursive thought is completely absent or largely absent, but but we're radiantly alive, radiantly aware. 
um, but there's de- there isn't a commentary or a discursive thinking of any kind. It's like a cloud, a completely blue sky, free from clouds. Um, so yeah, so we don't we don't cr- uh, create concepts in order to understand our experience. We just understand it. It's just immediately apparent without this extra layer of conceptualization kind of covering over or obscuring um, what's really going on. So that's the imageless um, samadhi. And then there's the biasless uh, samadhi. So I talked a minute ago about these biases. Um, So here there is no bias. It's a bit like a, a state of mind where there's no preference. There's no, I want this and I don't want that. That's completely pacified. So um, it's sometimes spoken of as being like a perfect sphere on a perfectly horizontal um, uh, plane. It's a perfect sphere sphere on a perfectly horizontal plane. So this, in a way, there's no um, compulsion or no that that the the, the the circle is not compelled to move in any di- any direction. Bit like a billiard ball on a billiard table or a pool ball a pool um you know like a pool ball is that what they're called you know what i mean on a pool table if you hit it it'll move but it doesn't it doesn't move without without something sitting in motion so in other words it's a state of poise um, where there's no egoistic desire there's no hunger for this or for that it's just a state of um yeah biaslessness um or directionlessness um, and uh, to, what, to put it slightly more positively, it's a state of, um, you could say, sort of perfect spontaneity. Yeah, you, 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 you can just respond. If you're in that state, you can just respond in a way purely and innocently to whatever arises without there being a compulsion to act in a particular way. It's really difficult to talk about these things because it starts sounding a bit sort of negative or a bit like an absence because it's so probably... Um, far away from our usual state of being, uh, but hopefully, uh, it's it's suggestive of something um, appealing. Um, the th- the third one, in a way that that danger I, I just mentioned is is in a way um, most acute when you start talking about the third one, which is the voidness or the emptiness samadhi, the shunyata samadhi. So Sangharasha talks about this as a full and complete realization of the ultimate nature of existence. So it's not, again, it's not just an, a glimpse, it's not just perfect vision, it's as if you see the true nature of things um, wherever you look. Um, to put it positively, actually, sometimes it's just a shunyata is described as the open dimension of being. You see everything as kind of open, everything is pregnant with um, possibility. So that's the um, the shunyata samadhi. So, so yeah, so, so what you get with samadhi is a very, very strong suggestion of, of completeness, of wholeness. And the image of a, of a circle is often given um, to suggest this. And if you look at the image behind me, the, the Buddha, he's often, you see the image of the Buddha, he's surrounded by a circle around his body and also around his head. And then of course there's this, he's in halo by a circle of flame, which, which suggests this state of wholeness, because it's not just a circle, it's actually like a, a sphere of light um, well, it's an aura really surrounding um, the Buddha with his heart at the center. So that's again a, a, an image that suggests that. And another image, of course, which which is a, you know a, again a, a profound image that goes re- very much to the that, that sort of layer um, beneath the conscious that something very um, uh, deep within us as, as as living organisms or human beings is the image of the full moon. Um, so I have I have that image here. I just want to show you the, the image of the full moon. So a, so a complete um, circle. You know it's so beautiful looking at the moon because it goes through these phases. When it become when it's full, uh, there's just something really magical about that. Um, this just that a, a circle is so complete. Um, it, it hasn't got any corners. Uh, it hasn't got any straight lines. There's an, there's an Irish artist, uh, Patrick Scott, some of you might know, who, who he seemed to spend most of his career just exploring circles. He, you know, he'd do these um, circles on canvas with um, gold leaf and just playing around with circles. But there's just something, 
yeah, really profound about just the image of a circle and, 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 the, and the suggestion of wholeness, of uh, completeness. And again, you find circles again and again in, in Buddhist imagery. Of course, the image of the, the Dhamma truck with the, 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 the eight spoke wheel is, is, of course, a circle that sits divided into eight different, um, eight different sections. And very often, um, images of Buddhas, they, they, they sit on a full moon. So the Buddha, you can't really see it, but just above the lotus here, you can see the leaves of the lotus. Just above the lotus is a, is a moon mat. So the Buddha is actually seated on a full moon, uh, which suggests this, this completeness, this wholeness, this integration, and this harmony. So yeah, so that's that's by way of um, hopefully some kind of an evocation of what samadhi really means, you know, the hot the, the integration, the, the the harmonization of the whole of our being, and so that that um, perfect vision isn't just a partial thing; it it, it sort of radiates outwards, um, which is you know what what the expression enlightenment really means. It's not just that the Buddha wakes up; the Buddha also sort of radiates uh, light. So, so what we're going to do now is um, we're actually just going to meditate. I thought it'd be a shame to talk about perfect samadhi and not actually practice a, a little bit. So we're just going to do a very simple practice of mindfulness of breathing, and we'll see if we can uh, explore this these degrees of deepening awareness, of deepening absorption within the breathing. So first of all, just connecting with the breathing um, and then allowing that to deepen until hopefully it becomes a refined, very um, absorbed um, kind of experience. So if you just like to set yourself up for meditation, we'll, we'll do some of that um, now. So beginning to tune in to the different strands of your experience of yourself.
So there's your body. Which is not one experience, it's many experiences. It's more like a flock of birds or a school of fish. Then something stationary and singular. There's feelings and emotions. There's the mood of your mind, of your heart. and thought. And then there's breathing. So breathing is an aspect of awareness of body. So trying to locate what that means in terms of lived experience and sensation. In terms of movement. And deciding consciously and deliberately to make the breathing the object of your attention. To really try and establish samadhi by focusing and deepening your focus on your breathing. making sure that that's led by curiosity, not just force. So we need an appropriate attention, not a forced attention on the one hand, or a vague attention on the other. I 
And as we enter into that, reminding ourselves of the scope of what is possible. Of the heights unifying with the depths. And for that integration to be illumined by wisdom. At this point, we can introduce the counting at the end of the out-breath. So mindfulness of breathing.
So we're moving into the second stage where we place the count before the in-breath. Letting go of the counting and just becoming more deeply absorbed breath by breath, inhalation and exhalation and the breathing.
bringing your attention to the point where you first feel the breath entering your body. So just before we finish, just casting your mind back over the course that we've done and just reflecting on things that you appreciated about the course and things that you might have done differently or things that you found lacking perhaps. So the course has been an attempt to introduce the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path and it's the first time it's been run in this way. So it would be very helpful for us to get some feedback on how you've found it. So just maybe thinking about anything that you'd like to say and don't be afraid of being critical 
because it's only through critical as well as appreciative comments that we can improve what we're doing. And then if you just want to just bring the meditation to a conclusion. So just, just a few things before we go to the break. Um, so first of all, just to remind you that um, this course has been part of what we're offering at the Buddha Center at the moment, which is a whole range of courses and pujas and retreats and events um, that we've been offering um, basically just to help people respond to the challenges of life and actually also to realize the potential that lies within human life. Um, that's what the Dharma is really about. It's really about making the most of being a human being. And yeah, like, like for a year now, we've been doing this on an entirely um, donation basis. So we've not been asking people to pay for anything. We've just been offering uh, the opportunity for people to give to support the work that we're doing. And I just wanted to remind you of that, seeing as it's the last night. And so you might want to give um, some money to the Buddha Center to help us keep doing what we're doing. Basically, the more money we have, the more we can do. It's the, the, the equation is really as simple as that. If we had more money right now, we could, for example, we could have more people working for us. Um, we'd like to develop our uh, Buddha Center. We'd like to buy a retreat center. There's loads of things we'd like to do. And a lot of the things that's preventing us from realizing those projects is simply money, actually. Um, so yeah, so we'd really invite you to to give to the Buddha Center if you want to, and if you can. And also just to put in your mind, um, the best way that you can support the Buddha Center is um, by giving a standing order, which means giving a, a monthly um, um, gift to the Buddha Center. And that, that what that means, particularly at the moment, it gives us a little bit of a sense of being able to plan forward and having some sense of what our income might be. So it really makes a huge difference, actually. Um, and anyway, so so Kevin's just put the link in the chat box there. And the other, so that's one thing I wanted to mention is, is the Dana. Oh. <laughs> so click on the second one. <laughs> um, and the second thing is, um, uh, yeah, just just basically, you know, um, we've been together for eight weeks and hopefully you've got a sense of a kind of momentum that's built over the course of the eight weeks and a sort of a deepening perspective and a deepening practice. So there's, there's something about courses which really facilitates that, you know, having a, a date, as it were, every week to sort of turn up and um, engage more deeply with your own mind, with other people as well. And um, so I just wanted to let you know about uh, two courses that are coming up. So one is one I'm going to be doing, which starts three weeks today on the 13th of April. It's called Transforming Work. And really what we're going to be doing is going more deeply into the, some of the things that we looked at on the when we looked at right livelihood or perfect livelihood. So really thinking about how we can bring these um, principles that we've learned into our work. Work is usually, or for most of us, or maybe many of us at least sometimes that the area in our life where we experience the most tension we experience the most stress where we experience ethical dilemmas um, where we really come up against um, the pressures of time all kinds of pressures and there's a load that we can do to, to um, respond more creatively to those pressures through bringing you know um, some of the principles that we've learned on the course to bear on those of those challenges. So that's really what the course is going to be about. It's going to be about doing that explicitly and consciously and deliberately in relation to our work. Um, and it's not just for people who are doing paid work, by the way, we're all working in some way, I'm sure. 
Um, so anyway, so that's um, starting. It's only a four week course starting on the 13th of April. So you'd be very welcome on that. It'd be lovely to see some of you back here on a Tuesday night. And then Vajashura, my friend Vajashura, um, is teaching a course called Sailing the Worldly Winds, um, which is looking at um, these things that assail us in life, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, fame and infamy. Um, there's two others which I can't think of at the minute, <laughs> and not a pair. So that, that's, that's starting on Mondays, it's Monday the 19th of April. So um, yeah, again, that's based on a book that calls Sailing in the Worldly Winds. And, I, and, and, and above all, I, I want, well, maybe not above all, but just one other thing that's coming up, which is over the Easter weekend, we're doing a, a retreat. And um, it's actually, it's one of the things that's really shocked me over the last year is how effective you, how effective a ret an online retreat can be. You can really go quite deep um, with others um, on an online retreat where you're, you know, you're, you're turning up to a Zoom, um, several Zoom meetings every day. And, and it, it's really quite remarkable actually how deep it can go. So we're gonna do a retreat like that. Um, it's gonna be about the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. So really fundamental, um, basically what Buddhism is. Buddhism is the three jewels and looking at how we can engage more deeply with the three jewels in order to bring about that liberation, which, um, which the Buddha himself embodies. So that's starting on the 1st of April, um, which is Thursday, the Thursday before Good Friday and finishing on Easter Monday. Um, anyway, and, and just before we go on a break, so it's just, um, what would be really wonderful, like I just, um, maybe slightly inappropriately ask you to think immediately after the meditation um, about the, the course, but it'd be really great to get a bit of feedback. So this, like I said, I've never run a course like this before on the on the vision and transformation on the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path. So I'd love to hear how you found it, particularly if there were things that you didn't um, think, well, things that you think could have been better or things that you thought were lacking. Um, so uh yeah do um do do feed that feed that into the chat box and i'll and i'll keep a record of that and i'll look at that next time i do this course so it'd be really really helpful and don't don't be afraid to be critical i don't i don't um I, i'd rather hear it than not hear it actually if you want to you can you can message me privately if, if you don't want you know if you don't want everyone to to hear what you're that you want to say and if you and if you've got any questions do please feed those in as well um so I'll give you a little bit of extra time to do that. So, so it's just gone eight minutes past. So let's come back at 20 past eight and then we'll, we'll, we'll enter into the, into the second part of the, the evening. So yeah, see you back, back at uh, 20 past eight. Okay, so um, we'll start back. Um, so thanks very much for the feedback. It's really, really great to hear it. Um, some, some helpful little tweaks that I can make actually. Um, so it's just, it's just I, I think part of the difficulty with a course like this is when you're with people, you get a, an immediate reading on how people are, uh, are, are finding what you're saying, because you can see it written on their faces, but you don't get that online. You, you, it's a weird sense of it's almost like talking into an empty space. Um, you don't get much back. And um, so that, I think that's why it's doubly helpful to get to, to actually hear people say how they found things. Um, so yeah, it's much appreciated. There is one question, um, which is, I am curious about the use of Buddhist icons. Nobody knows what the Buddha looked like. Um, have we a human desire or need to imagine what the Buddha looked like, possibly assist us in our practice? I spent my younger years disliking Catholic icons and now I am struggling with the introduction of Buddhist images. Could you please say a little bit about this if there is time? Yeah, so that that's actually a really, a fascinating question. So it seems that um, we need, like human beings have this deep need to create images to express what is important to us. Um, so, you know, this goes right back to, you know, cave painting. Um, and, you know, all throughout the human history, we've created images. Um, to, yeah, like I say, to express what is most, well, to express all kinds of things, but um, particularly to express what's most important to us, to, to express um, what's deepest about life and so on. Um, and it seems that for quite a number of, quite a few hundred years after the Buddha, after the Buddha's Paranirvana or his death, people didn't produce images of the Buddha. People probably felt that it was impossible to 
capture who the Buddha was in a particular image, whether a three-dimensional image or a two-dimensional image. But at a certain point in history, images did start to emerge. And it's as if people um, who were um, affected by, by the Dharma, by his teaching, were influenced by um, stories about who he was, just spontaneously um, express that in terms of particular images. So it may be, for example, like I mentioned earlier about, um, you know, meditating on an image of the Buddha. Um, so that, so, so, so and I talked about it in terms of, in a way, taking an image, looking at an image and reflecting on it, and then sort of, in a way, internalizing that. But it might be that um, an image of the Buddha just emerges in your mind quite naturally. And that'll, and he'll look slightly different to different people. In a way, what the Buddha actually really looked like is not, um, is not terribly important. But what is important is that we have some kind of way of connecting with who he was and the qualities that he had, and um, producing images and reflecting on images and, and and looking at images is 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 a way that we can do that. Um, and I suppose one other thing to bear in mind in that area is that. We need an image which is, as it were, indigenous to us. So, um, so this image behind me is is like is is, is, obvi- is clearly a Westerner. It's not an it's not an Asian um, person. So the Buddha obviously wasn't a Westerner. He was Indian. Um, but it's as if we need to know that we ourselves in our particular form can actually attain the state of awakening that we have that within us because we're human beings. We happen to be living in Ireland. Most of us are Westerners. Um, so we need, to, you know, the, the image, the our our, hist, our image history is different from somebody who's from Asia. So we'll, we'll approach that. We'll come to that in a different way. And what's happening at the moment, which is fascinating, is that we're in a way developing a kind of like um, a repertoire of, of of Western Buddhist images. And that that process, I'm sure, if if Buddhism continues to take root in the West, that will continue to. Um, to happen, and you, you can see that happening over over the centuries in different countries. You know, in in China and Tibet, in Japan, images produced which are slightly different, um, and that 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 re- reflect the local um, culture, but yet express something which is fundamental to, to you know to, to human experience. It's not culturally um, determined. Anyway, hopefully that sort of answers your question. Um, don't worry if you don't like the images that you see. Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, it's, it, it was interesting that I, I I was in India and I I saw a lot of images of the Buddha and I saw one image of the Buddha which I thought, wow, that's the Buddha. <laughs> but and it was so beautiful and I realized that most of the Buddhas and images I'd seen it would left, actually left me cold that. I could I recognize them as a Buddha and I would relate to them as such, but they kind of left me cold. But I remember seeing this one image in Saranath where the Buddha first communicated the Dharma. And it just it just it, there's something about it that communicated something about who the Buddha was to me. And um it was, you know, quite something to see. Um anyway, that's just, just a slight digression. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um Okay, cool. So, so what we're going to do now, um, I think that's all the questions. I'll have a look um, in a minute just to check. But um, what I thought would be nice is to go back into our breakout rooms. So a number of people have, have said how much they appreciated the breakout rooms and having being with the same people every week. So, so what we'll do is um, we'll we'll go back into our breakout rooms, um, and um, I've just got a couple of questions. Basically, um, so yeah. So the first question is what is 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 looking back on the course like can you it's, it's like we've been on this trip you know we've been on a journey um and very often when you go on a journey it's nice to to have a souvenir which rem- reminds you about maybe a place that you visited or an experience that you had so that when you have that when you hold that object you can remember you can um you can reconnect with the significance of that occasion or that event or that place so looking back over the eight weeks, over the over the um, the terrain, as it were, that we've covered, you know, what what would you take as a souvenir uh, from from this journey? What what would you 
want to take as a, as a, as a kind of memento of something that you that that, you, that was really important to you that you want to continue to remember. And the second question is connected, which is, is there, are there any intentions that you want to go forward with, you know, any particular things like I, I really want to meditate every day, or I want to keep in contact with other Buddhists, or I want to go on a retreat, or um, I want to read more, or I want to explore the Eightfold Path, I don't know, it could be anything, but um, it, it, it'll be, it'll there'll probably be some similar themes, but it's an op opportunity just to kind of reflect about that. And you might like to just kind of report out, as it were, just sort of, just say a little bit about how you found the course overall. Um, so maybe we could, we could do the groups for, um, oh, let's say, um, what time is it now? Can, we, can you put them on for 24 minutes, Kevin? Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah that's perfect. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. So, let, let, so yeah, so let, 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 let's do that now. So um, we'll go into our groups. So, yeah, so we're coming to the end now. Um, so, yeah, well, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank um, all the group leaders. So... There's been a team of um, 14 of us who have been doing the groups each week. Um, so I, do, I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, so um, so that's Billy and Stephen and Yvonne and Siobhan and Sam and Liz and Dolores and Julie and Anne and Dan, who wasn't able to come tonight, he wasn't well, um, Lindsay and uh, Marco. Um, so yeah, just, um, yeah, big shout out, big thanks to you for being here every week and just, just kind of sharing your own experience and sharing your own commitment and uh, just kind of, um, yeah, sort of when I, enabling people to, to have a more substantial experience of not just encountering a teaching, but actually encountering, encountering a, a community. Um, so that, I think it's, it's really added something to the course. So thanks very much to all of you. Um, Particular thanks to Kevin, um, who has been beavering away in the background um, more than you might realize. <laughs> he's been the one, for example, he's been editing the videos each week, posting them online, sending out all the emails, quite a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to enable this to happen every week. So um, thanks a million, Kevin. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks also to Claire Kelly, who's out there somewhere, who um, looked after one of the groups one week when somebody wasn't able to be here. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, just a big thanks to everybody for, for helping out. Um, I kind of feel like a thanks are due as well to, um, this, this course has been very, very closely based on, um, a series of lectures that were given by Sangharachita who wrote, um, well, the, the book that you've been reading is actually an edited, um, an edit, edited version of these lectures that were given in 1968, um, in London in a basement. When at the very beginning of our Buddhist movement, um, when it first started, um, so yeah, so very, well, I've been very much following his um, lead, really. And I just wanted to post um, a link. You can actually listen to those talks um, online, and uh, I'll just post it in the chat box. Oops. Um, there's a whole wealth of material, like literally hundreds of talks. That he's given over the years um he he passed away a couple of years ago but there's an incredible wealth of stuff and there's some absolutely brilliant like it's brilliant material um it's got a slightly unusual um way of speaking so it's, so it can take a little bit of getting used to but there's some absolutely brilliant stuff i mean really fantastically brilliant stuff and it's all available for free um to download i mean they ask again they ask that they, they, they operate in the way we do in terms of a, do, a donation basis but but it's all just for free you can just listen to this absolutely brilliant dharma teaching um for free so i kind of feel like thanks are due to to sankarachita as well for, for for basically giving the the outline and the framework and and most of the material that i've been communicating comes directly from him um and um yeah we've been kind of on an imaginary journey together we're just talking about this in our group um, you know, it has felt like a journey and, uh, that's the myth. Uh, so the metaphor of, um, the Eightfold Path is, is it, is, well, is, is of that as a path. So, you know, that's the way that we speak, isn't it? It's like, we talk about, you know, going from here to, to somewhere else. Um, 
But I suppose in a way, we shouldn't make that take that too literally. It's it's not really quite like that because, you know, when you, if I walk from here to my house, when I leave here, I leave here and I'll probably come back, but I've kind of left that behind. But when you when you walk along the spiritual path or the Dharma, the path of the Dharma, it's as if you, it's like a cumulative path. So you have a little bit of vision um, that influences the way that you um emote it influences the way that you communicate the way that you act the way that you're in your living and so on and then that um, into integration of that vision provides the basis for a deeper vision to emerge and then one transforms oneself in line with that vision and then a deeper vision emerges and all of that you kind of carry along with you um, so it's, it's a, like a cumulative kind of process a progressive process um, so I think it's important not to sort of take the idea of a path too literally so we have in a way, we are you are the path if if, if you're practicing it. Um, it finds expression in, 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 in the way that you actually are. Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to sort of finish with that idea of just in a way, just, just being careful not to sort of take the whole thing too literally. So often that the image that's given um, in, in Buddhism for um, for the path is more like a a, a process of growth so the buddha you know like seating on a seated on a lotus so a lotus is a flower that grows up out of the water emerges clear of the water and unfolds and um again that's we can understand the process in that kind of way of the, of a of a it's a process that means that we can develop our human potential to its fullest like like a plant does you know the, the rain falls the sun um falls on the leaves of the, of the plant or the tree and it grows into its own um, self into its own and, and according to its species and so on and we we do that as well um, so yes yeah, so and I you know one, maybe one last thing just as some of it we were talking a little bit about the retreat in our group and all of you would be well able for the retreat that's over the Easter weekend um, you'd be all well able for it you all know the meditations you all you've all you've all got the ability to turn up you're still here at the end of eight weeks so you'd all be well able for it so I'd really encourage you to come along um don't be nervous and if you don't like it no one's going to know if you just don't log on if you know what I mean I mean it's going to weigh you don't you, you know I'd really encourage you to um to uh come along but if you don't like it if it's not for you, you you haven't lost anything so you might as well give it a go if you sort of see what I mean if if it was a residential retreat you'd have to drive somewhere and etc etc but it's really really easy to, to participate so anyway i just, just really encourage you to come on the, the retreat if you can and and i hope maybe one last thing just i just hope i see some of you again i mean my only regret with the course is i i just see little pictures you know it's about you know three postage stamps big so i, I haven't got a sense of of you as individuals as much as i would have liked except for the people that were in my in the, in the group that i was in so so anyway, so hopefully i'll get to meet you again and i hopefully i get to meet you in the flesh uh, that would be really lovely so um anyway you know where we are and um we'll send you an email uh, myself and kev with a whole bunch of things um that you can uh, look at book on to etc um so if you've got any questions um sort of outstanding as it were do 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 hang about i'll be here for another little while and other than that um see you later